Well, I'll read our opening prayer, and then I'll let David uh, uh, give us his, uh, his uh, literary quote, and then we'll proceed. Uh, and I, I will read today in English, Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe. You have sanctified us through your commandments and commanded us to busy ourselves in things of Torah. Amen. 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 Okay, David, you're on. Okay, today, in honor of the uh, annual Tucson Festival of Books, I looked high and low to find a poem about books. And I found this one by Robert Louis Stevenson, and I'm going to quote four stanzas from it. There in the night where none can spy, all in my hunter's camp I lie and play at books that I have read till it is time to go to bed. These are the hills. These are the woods. These are my starry solitudes. And there by the river, by whose brink the roaring lions come to drink. I see the others <laughs> far away, as if in firelit camp they lay, and I like to an Indian scout around their party prowled about. And so when my nurse comes in for me, home I return <laughs> to the sea and go to bed with backward looks at my dear land of storybooks. Thank you very much. And back to you, Marty. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very nice. And our uh, name, Marty, Marty, another ma a name for uh, us, for Bnei Israel, for uh, Jews, is the people of, of the, the book. book. Yes. Of the book. Yes, definitely. <laughs> And uh, thank you, David, very much for reading that. Okay, well, thank you. My pleasure. You're you're welcome. Anyway, the um, we have been reading about a, uh, the restatement of the covenant between God and the and Moses and the Israelites. So uh, let's uh, pick up on Exodus 34, 27. Okay, would you like me to, to start it? I'm trying to That's find fine. Um, uh, and, and if anyone wants to okay, read yeah. later, just raise a hand and, and oh, we'll, we'll get you in there. Okay, go ahead, David. And the Lord said unto Moses, I to bear it in oil, most shall any more. Write thou these words, that after the terror, for after the terror of the words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And okay, he was let's there. stop there. Let's stop there, because I don't know if David has edited some of this himself, or if his, if, is that what's written in your, uh, your Torah? Uh, Pretty much. I did add the Hebrew there of uh, the first I sentence. know, I know that. My version because... is the, the uh, Holy Scriptures according to the Masoretic text. Right. Uh, because um, we have, in, instead of uh, terror, we have, for in accordance with these commandments, I make a covenant with you and with Israel. Okay. Actually, and I tread terror, and uh, it should have been tenor. Tenor. Okay. That makes a little okay. better. That's okay. okay. I will flog, flog myself for that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I have <Okay>. my request. Hi. <laughs> Gail, you finally made it, and Rabbi Norman, I'm glad you're here, and Rabbi Mary. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Sorry, my computer, my computer thought that uh, it's Shabbat, it should rest and not be, uh, <laughs> but I had to convince it that the Torah study connected Kulam, you know, <laughs> more important than anything. Rabbi, you are among the rest of us who had, most of us had difficulties getting on today. Anyway, I want to, um, uh, so it, it, we are about to, to read uh, uh, 
Exodus 34, verse 38. Okay, David, why don't you... Uh, well, I only see... David, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Okay. I'm there. Okay, uh, yes. Michael. Pardon, excuse me. Excuse me. Did we get all the way? I thought I I thought we had stopped a little bit earlier. Did I miss something? Well, it's 28. Yeah, 20 like in the yeah. 27. 28. No, I think that it's before because it's a very touchy subject there. Right. I mean, I know that we we did boil a kid in his mother's milk. I know that we did that. Right, and then and verse twenty seven is, and the Lord said to Moses, "Write down these commandments, yeah. for in accordance with these commandments, I make a covenant with you and Israel." That's what I just read. Do you want me to right. go on? No, where are wait wait a minute? Wait, where are we really? Seriously. Okay, Michael not, has his hand up. Let yeah. me let me call on him. Yes, Michael. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to. I I, I want to read twenty eight in honor of Betty's recovery. Very good, Michael. Okay. Would you let me do that, please? Yes. Twenty eight. What? Uh, Twenty eight. Exodus, Exodus thirty four verse. 28. Okay. Uh, and he was there with the Lord 40 days. And he ate no bread and drank no water. And he wrote down on the tablets the terms of the covenant, which are the Ten Commandments. Okay. Any questions? I, I know. Yes, Rabbi. Pardon Rabbi, me if I no. ask, Michael. I I didn't know that there was uh, something with Betty. Can you elaborate, or do you want to tell me privately or something? Well, I I talked about that. I don't want to take any more time. What you can you you you're welcome to call me after Torah study. Give me a call, and I'll and I, I, can, okay. I can I can clue you and give you a. Uh, a summary of what happened. All right, or else, or else, I'll see you tomorrow, and and and, and I'll ask you after that tomorrow. Okay. What? Okay. 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 Didn't mean anybody, to. Did, did, uh, any comments about that? I'll I'll yes. jump in. This is please. please. Moses is the one who was writing in the, the you know the the first time in chapter twenty. God wrote the commandments or inscribed by by lightning on the tablet, however you want to see it. But here, God is dictating, and Moses is Moses is writing it down for for whatever that's worth in some kind of a change. Is it a change in the uh, the terms, as was the translation there? Is it a, is it uh, a change in the relationship between God and Moses? Question mark, question mark. Well, it's a it's a good question. Any any comments, just on? Well, if Moses is gonna do the writing, then he's got his stone chisel and hammer out. It's gonna take 40 days and 40 nights at least. Um, yeah. Seems like a practical consideration to me. It is so you know, the first time God uh it, 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 the the tablets are written with the finger of God, and now, and now Moses has to do the task, and there's going to be a little transformation that we're going to read about that. But there's something to be said about the difference between between telling people what to do or setting the example and doing it in front of them or asking them to join in with you to do the task. Comments? Yes, Don. I should, I'm sorry, I should have added that um, Moses smashed the first tablets. Yes, and, he did. And this 
he, he wouldn't be so quick if he had to do the carving himself. I think there's a little lesson there. It's like uh, excellent point. Be, be careful what, what, what you break. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, uh, he smashed something that's even quite holy, <laughs> you know, because it's written by God himself. And so that's the point. Marsha and then Gail. I think that maybe it's bringing more into his community by having a leader do it and taking perhaps more responsibility than just accepting it. Okay. Very, very good. Very good. Very good point. Yes, Gail. I was just going to, I agree with Marsha. I think it's kind of a subtle way of God passing on the responsibility to Moses to do the job. Okay. It's very subtle, but it's there. Okay. Yes, Larry. Is there a difference between the first edition and the second edition? There is. Do you want to point that out? Okay, according to a freedman, yeah, the second set of the commandments appears here. Three of them are similar to the commandments that appear in Exodus 20. The commandment against bowing to other gods, um, the commandment against molten gods, and the commandment to cease work on the seventh day. The other seven are different from the Ten Commandments that God speaks aloud over Sinai. In critical biblical scholarship, we understand these two versions of the Decalogue to come from two different ancient sources. But how um, we get to understand them in the final um, form of the Torah, the answer may lie in a second contradiction. I mean, do you want me to go through all this? Okay. In the first, I don't mind it. It's it's very important because this is there. There are these differences. We're also going to see that again later on, and if in maybe in another five years. <laughs> in the first verse of this chapter, God tells Moses, "In quotes, I'll write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablet." But now God tells Moses, "Write these words for yourself." Perhaps we should understand this to mean that God writes the words on one side of the tablet and Moses writes the words of the second set of commandments on the other side. As is commonly noted, the majority of the first set are ethical commandments involving relations between humans and other humans. Don't murder, don't steal. The second set are mainly ritual commandments observe the holidays, redeem the firstborn, don't sacrifice with leaven. The two sets are thus complementary, involving the two essential kinds of commands, relations between humans and humans, and relations between humans and God. Very good. Yes, uh, Rabbi Norman. Yeah, I'm far be it from me to totally disagree with uh, Professor Friedman, but I but I but I see it differently. Um, the second set of tablets, which we don't have a text for here, we don't see the text as Marty you were implying until Deuteronomy. So I think it's Deuteronomy chapter ten, um, <coughs> and in there it's Moses recounting or reviewing for a new generation of Israelites, the whole, the whole history, uh, the whole experience through the wilderness. And the way I see it, this, the second set of tablets or the second listing of the Ten Commandments, if we want to use that phrase, is Moses's paraphrasing. And, and Moses makes almost, if not, I don't know if it's intentional or unintentional, but Moses is the one who makes the change. No, no, I'm on the Torah. Not, not to God. Me. Please hang up. Um, in, in God's dictation to Moses. But when Mo, because of Moses having, here it's 40 days, 40 nights, but later on it's after 40 years of experience with the Israelites 
And so when he's when he's now reminding them of the Ten Commandments, he's kind of making a few changes respecting their specific experience uh and and uh et cetera et cetera et cetera so i i see it a little bit differently i don't see that that this phrase here or this particular verse in in exodus is referring to that second set or the or the second listing thank you michael you had your hand up before i think Michael, did you have your hand up before? No, 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 thank oh, you. No, okay. No, no, thank you, Marty. Okay. Don, then. Um, yeah, thank you, Marty. Um, and I'm glad the rabbis are here today because whatever I say is usually so weakly informed that I need help. But I, I got it during the week, I got more into the, the question of the destruction of the tribes that lay in front of the Israelites as instructed by God. And I, digging deeper, I found that um, this the version, the second version of the Torah that, that we're now discussing was written, is the P version of the Torah, written by the priests in the Babylonian captivity, when there was a terrific emphasis on the prevention of inbreeding by the Israelites. Because the ground we covered earlier in Genesis, everybody was inbreeding. You know, Joseph had an Egyptian wife, and and Moses had all sorts of um, mixed tribal relationships in his genealogy. And now, all of a sudden, there's a terrific emphasis on purity of the Israelites to the extent that the Canaanites, the Hittites, and Moses has Hittites in his family, but they're all going to be destroyed for what seems to me to prevent them from in, in interbreeding with the Israelites. So, so, so with this new emphasis on the second version of the tablets, which the content of which is not fully revealed, I'm coming a long way around to ask about whether this is the contribution of the priests during the Babylonian exile to the Tanakh. And I, I realize it could be totally off base here, so. Uh, Don, two things. Um, I'm not really understand what you said, and I'm sorry, it's my fault. And the second, to. could you come closer to the microphone, please? I'm sorry. It's really... It's really difficult to, to me, sorry. Yeah, okay, is that there? <laughs> a little. Okay, there are a whole bunch of hands that have gone up. And uh, uh, Michael has had his hand up for a while. Larry has his hand up. Uh, let me have them come in. They may be able to answer that and then Mary may get the gist of your statement and we can come back to your statement if the others have misinterpreted anything. Yes, Michael. Uh, the smashing of the tablets, that was, I wanna get this right, cause I'm not uh, uh, terribly uh, remembering so, of these things, uh, uh, the, but the, the smashing of the, it was the first set of tablets that was smashed, right? Not, not the second. Okay. Right. So, right. So therefore, uh, what I would say to that is that I think that God was testing. I think God was testing Moses. And the reason I come by that is because of the second set. I don't think that if it was not, if it was not a test, he would have never issued a second set of tablets. And uh, that's just a, a, something that I'm, I'm getting here. Interesting point. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, Larry. In different translations, I have seen the end of 28, 10 words, not 10 commands. 
now, was this a list of words or was it more than that? And how come we interpret this now as command? It's a command, it's, it's a translation. In Hebrew, you say, aseret adibrot, which is the same uh, root of devarim. It doesn't say the 10 mitzvot. Uh, so, and the book itself, it's called Dvarim, uh, the book that comes up. Uh, so, um, I don't know why the translation is from mitzvot, commandments, from the word Dvarim. Uh, Rabbi Norman, do you know? Uh, only just to add that, that traditional literature Jewish literature never refers to Ten Commandments as as a seret a, a mitzvot. There are the six hundred and thirteen commandments, but they didn't want to give uh, make it appear as if any ten or twelve or three were more important than the others. So the the phrase in the Torah and then throughout the literature in Hebrew is devarim or dibrot as uh, Rabbi Miri was is saying. The, Eng the English perhaps influenced more by the Christian translations, mm -hmm. uh, but the English becomes Ten Commandments. But you won't, you really don't see that in Hebrew Jewish literature at all. Okay. And certainly not in the, in the Torah or in the Bible. So it, it, Don, Don's question it, it has not been addressed. <laughs> yeah, okay. It, it, because it, it really comes down to who wrote the Bible <laughs> and, right. you know, which combination. Yeah. I'm, and I'm and really here you have, it sounds like two accounts. The wording is enough to say that maybe it is two accounts that it take, that you have to, uh, uh, by two different people. Gail has, is, and then I'll come back to Rabbi Norman. Yeah, I'm just going to mention that it's two different sources writing two yeah. different stories. So, I mean, according, you know, to this, who wrote, you know, the yeah. source revealed. So the <clears throat> verses uh, 27 through 20, yeah, 27 and 28, uh, that's Judah, you know, that particular the J, J the J and then when we go to J 29 then when we go to 29 that's getting back into the priestly uh, versions so right. that's why there's some confusion and my my understanding yes rabbi Norman. yeah and the and the second or, or at least at least the uh, again moses's summary of or moses's um uh listing of those 10 sayings the quote unquote 10 commandments that is definitely d source it's much later it's the deuteronomy it's the deuteronomy source so uh, it's, it uh, can be based on some of the others but as gail is saying and as as don found in his reading much of what we're seeing here is indeed uh, uh influenced by the priestly by the p source can you imagine the controversies that existed as to how they would edit this book? Who's because the they? Because you have to combine who's, whoever who's they the were. They? Who's the they? The what, people who have, put, how they edited. You see, well, the, the, the different commentators, the different people who wrote accounts Okay, so you have the, ori the original, version, the J version, the original text, okay. and you put all this right. all together. You put this. It it, it it's. A, I'm sure that somebody had to do some editing somewhere to say which pieces of which commentary we're going to insert where in the version that we're reading. The original is still for the Torah is there. But if there are different segments, it makes it very difficult. Yes, Gail? I think sometimes when they're editing, when they were putting this together, you know, they, <laughs> depending on yeah, when. Whoever, that's right. I think there might, have, there might have been an inclination here and there for them to be afraid to toss anything. 
So they sometimes put in more than, you know, and they, yeah. therefore you're, you're getting duplicate stories with a slight difference and, and that sort of thing, which adds to the confusion, mm -hmm. but it makes for a very interesting talk. So there you are. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, first, Rabbi Mary, and then I'll come back to you, Don. Well, um, one of the things that we need to think about is that we're talking about oral stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying mm -hmm. not Torah, but in general. So it's oral. And if the teacher makes you memorize this paragraph when you come to class, you're not going to say exactly because you don't remember. It was not written so. But here, the emphasis on writing, it's very interesting because most of the people could not read and they couldn't read for a long time. So, so it is Moshe declaring those things that he wrote with here and there paraphrasing. Now, my, my comment now is very much controversial by many people. Uh, this is a story. This is a story, not history. This is the, the story, the mythological story of our people. And in this way, it sounds, uh, it sounds, okay, this is the word of God, but Moses changed because he is not God after all, you know. Uh, so for the story itself, after smashing this, then he reconstructed and uh, tells the story in a little different way. This is how I see the, the controversial thing. And we go into the Shabbat, Shamor Vezachor, that there are statements that are not exactly, but we really relate to them in our religiosity. The second thing I want to say is someone said, uh, I don't remember, that uh, at the beginning it was between God and humans and after that between humans and humans. And uh, it happens to me in every class or every group that I attend. Oh, but murdering is also a, a, a sin against God. So basically all the, the, all the Varim are against God. And this I'm throwing just as something that people usually say. Sorry to speak too much, sorry. No, no, thank no, no, you, no, no, no. thank you. Okay, Don. That, that well, and uh, we'll, okay. and then we want. Uh, let me call on um, uh, uh, Helene. Let sure. me call on Helene first. I'm so grateful I was well enough to come today, because this particular topic is so mixed up in my head. And the way I was raised, it was ten commandments. Those were the ten commandments. And if you didn't follow those exact commandments, you weren't doing the right thing. And now I'm listening carefully, and that's not true. The, if there's that many commandments, the, the rabbi, then here, what you people are talking about, I'm going to have to rethink this whole thing. Thank you. Okay. Thank uh -huh. you. But you, but the gist of each version is what matters okay they they're very they're close enough that what whichever one you were taught you stay with it that's okay <laughs> yeah, okay dad Helene, i never found any reason to repeat the whole thing but um but anyway this is a sidebar i don't know if anybody saw the report that the oldest Jewish Bible in existence, which is about a thousand years old, is being, and it was hand copied by a single scribe, is being put up for auction. No, it's the second oldest. To set the right. Sassoon, the Sassoon Codex, Sassoon, yeah, yeah. the second and, oldest. But I, I was so disgusted because it's expected to fetch thirty million dollars on the block. <laughs> I thought we monetize everything. You know, here's the oldest Jewish Bible in existence, and what are we doing with it? You know, it's 
it's going south of these is going to put it up on the block. So anyway, that was just a sidebar. But thank thank you, um, Rabbi Mary, because um, I know its story, um, and it's it can't be proven as history. But everything is story. I mean, David will 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 note, note that the Big Bang is story that every astrophysicist subscribes to. It's, you know, it's not proven history, it's, it's a story. So uh, I think we have a great story. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Amy, and then but I want to ask you People are going to tell so. you, that, Don, people are going to tell you that history is based on facts. So uh, that's where the twist starts, that, that uh, okay, what's the fact? I think Toyn, Toyn <laughs> said, in my in my mind it's not so. Toynbee said there is no history; there is only biography, which I, I love that. Okay, okay. Uh, Amy has had her hand up with a lot of interruptions, so Amy, go ahead. Thank you, Marty. Um, I'm very interested to know more about this Bible. I wonder, if Rabbi Norman. Um, can tell us a little bit about it. This um, this one that has just been found and in, in, um, transcribed. No, it's not that it's just been found. It was it it's been in the hands of private collectors for for generations. Oh. The the Sassoon, which is a very very well known, actually, um, any of you who participated, or if you didn't, you can you can watch the recording of it um, when we had the presentation from my student who talked about the Jews of India. And he and he he talked about it, it was right at the same time. The Sassoon family of India there are the ones oh. who, who were the uh, uh, who had owned and purchased hundreds of years ago this particular codex as it uh, yet yeah, as a holy book, but also I suppose as an investment, um, and now it's being put up on the on the auction block is is what uh, 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 what what Don was talking about. the The oldest code or codex copy of of a handwritten and it's not a scroll; it's in a book form. It's not the scroll; is called the Aleppo Codex. And uh, for a long time, it was at the Vatican. I forget exactly which museum it's at now, but the Vatican uh, held it in their in their possession. And that's the that's the oldest, and then the the one that's called the Sassoon Codex is the second oldest. Well, I mean, there, is the a, presentation. there is a novel called uh, Amy. There is a, a a novel called The People of the Book that yes. it is about the Aleppo. Sorry. Yes. Go ahead, Amy. Well, thank you. Um, I watched the um, presentation on the Jews of India, but I did not know what he was referring, you know, the significance of the Sassoon family beyond what he had shared with us. So that's very interesting to me. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Sure. Uh, I have a question. A, a good number of years ago, I had uh, heard, or well, I had read actually, that uh, the that uh, there were there were a whole series of different wordings uh, that uh, you had the uh, you had Proto Hebrew. He uh, first you had oral, then you had Proto Hebrew. Then you had the later Hebrew. Then it was then Torah was translated also into a number of different Aramaic Greece. languages. Greece was and the so, first. Greek. Well, this comes this comes later. This comes later, and mm -hmm. then uh, there there is a. Um, we, we we come across the name Johan Yo, uh, Johanan uh, the Greek, who and that's the that's uh, the uncle, was, the, uncle the uncle yes. translation mm -hmm. and and 
and there was so, I, I'm going to use the word convention as opposed to because what what we've been talking about you wouldn't find in the orthodox in the orthodoxy they would be saying what's written that's one and only way to to look at it what we're doing is say that there are other people who have done research and the research said that there was like uh uh the, the onkelos translation is what we now use or a combination of things where this was all this discussion took place because they were you were getting different variations in everything i have you heard anything about that whether i'm going to ask the rabbis yes okay rabbi norman yeah there there are uh, I, I think it was David at, earlier on when I first logged on this morning that he had just used the phrase that this was according to the Masoretic tradition. Yes. Okay. So the so the Masoretes the word comes comes from the, the Hebrew Masora the 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 transmitters uh, the, or the, those who had received it had been transmitted on down to them and then they became the uh, uh, the traditionalists if you will they're the ones who give us the form in which we have our present Torah, both in the scroll form or in the Bible form uh, or in a book form. Uh, pr prior to that, there, there were a number of, call them translations, call them codexes or codices, you know, which, whichever you want. Um, as, as Rabbi Miri said, it was, it was an oral tradition for, many, many generations. Uh, and uh, you know, one they finally written down there is there is one legend um that uh a, a number of rabbis were placed in in caves and were told, okay, come up with uh, with the exact wording of what the Torah should be. And how what is it? Seven, I, probably seven. seven. Seven years later, yeah. you know, they they all emerge, and and lo and behold, and they just, all have exactly the same, the exactly the same text, word for word, letter for letter. And so the assumption is divine intervention, and that's exactly the text. But we but we do know based on some of these very very ancient texts that we do do his even if we only have fragments of them but there are some differences it might be a spelling difference mm -hmm. uh you know it, they're not major theological changes but there there are differences enough to show to people i would say like us i'm generalizing it generalizing intelligent sophisticated people to say aha there's there's a human hand at work here okay it may have been divinely inspired but the there there certainly is something human involved in transmitting from generation to generation to generation sure and yes Rabbi marty marty we spoke about it many Thank times you. because and i ask people that have translations to say yeah. what their translations say in that word, because we know that some have different, and the difference is also embedded in the belief how things are. It's an interpretation. So the chose the the chosen words mm -hmm. are the interpretation of the person that writes it. Uh, my example is the difference between stubborn and uh, and persistent. So, you know, it depends which word you use, the connotation is going to be different. Mm -hmm. So I think that all these translations are, and then they come again, and as Rabbi Norman said, okay, these human beings make mistakes. We don't have, like in the translation in English, full stop, stop, uh, marks, uh, uh, the big letters, and so forth. In, in Hebrew. That's why it's so interesting. This is the topic 
that it comes up today in our discussion about Moses. It's going to come up very shortly. Okay. Well, yes, it, Rabbi. It, it already has. So, picking up on what Rabbi Mary said, my my favorite example is forty days. The number forty that keeps on coming up. And again, if you're mm -hmm. back in an oral tradition for hundreds of, of years, then the word forty in Hebrew is arba'im. The number, and, and then the Hebrew word for many is harbe. And if you're just if if you're listening quickly in a conversation, wait a minute. Do they say forty or do they say many? Uh, 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 we'll just choose one. And arbitrarily, it became forty rather than many days, many nights. I mean, I'm not sure that when Moses went up to the top of the mountain that somebody started, okay, this is day one, this is day two, sure. this is day three, <laughs> this is day four, except- And wait his only own, five. <laughs> right, his own, his own children, his own sons are saying, okay, dad, you know, come on back. Enough. Now, remember, <laughs> Yohanan was Greek. He can, basically, he was a Greek that knew he could, did he convert uh, to Judaism? Yeah, Uncleos. Yeah, Uncleos. Yeah, Uncleos. And uh, and although what uh, conversion meant in those days, we're not really sure. But that's besides the point, right? But the but in addition, we're going to. So here is Hebrew translated into Greek back into Hebrew. Now, and we know that Latin is going to do the same thing. No, no, not exactly. They, they no. base it on No, Greek. no, Marty, sorry. No, the Latin I'm sorry. translation. The Latin translation is only on the Greek. It's not on the Hebrew. Yes, that's what I, yeah, that's oh, what okay. I was oh, I corrected right. myself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Based on the Greek. And so now you're going we're going to be reading something that is very interesting. Okay, and we'll let you pick up on that. Okay. Uh, yeah, oh, yes, Don. I just want to do a microphone check. Is that volume any better? That's better. Okay. Much better. Much better. And also, I regret I have to leave around 11, so I'll say that. Okay. okay. Well, we'll get through this. Since you, you initiated the discussion, th this here is going to further compound the discussion, if you will. So we are on verse 29. Okay, if we would read uh, verse 29 and 30. Can you hear me? Uh, is there someone who would like to read? Okay, Gail. Well, let me call on Gail and we'll come back to the <clears throat> And it was when Moses was coming down oops, from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he was coming down from the mountain. And Moses had not known that the skin of his face was transformed when he was speaking with him. And Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses. And here the skin of his face was transformed, and they were afraid of going over to him. Okay, Moses, now there are different translations. There are different translations. Exactly. Do you want Gail to? Gail is Friedman. Right. Gail is Friedman. Right. Yes. <clears throat> uh, and, and so, David, if, oh, yes, uh, go ahead, Larry, and then, and then we'll, uh, I wanted to ask David to read his version of the same lines okay and and then there's another version also so uh larry why, okay. why don't you uh Gail use the word transform i have the translation radiate and radiant the, that's a good one too yeah now um, what the, about cloud you have cloud okay i have cloud uh what is what do you uh, have martin the, Came down from the mountain, uh, and the face was radiant. Okay. Anyone has another word, Amy? What's your word? Okay, mine. Can you hear me all right? 
Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, David. Can you just Barbara. move closer yeah. to your microphone? All right, here we go. Um, and it mine says, and it came to. Okay, in just a moment. I, I'm oh. I, I'm on the tour study, so. Oh, well, I, I can help you. <laughs> No barking. Okay, David, why don't you uh, okay. graceful mute yourself on, and please. then you, we can. No, it's green. Mine says, yeah. it came okay. to pass when Moses came down yes. from the mount. Oh, so and I Two tables of the testimony. Put straight down. When he came down from the mount, that Moses. Oh, wow. the skin of his okay, face. Did, did, Grace. Oh, Grace. Could you turn, uh, could you mute yourself, Grace? Oh, but this is Ayesha. Oh, well. Yeah, I'm going to mute yourself. Grace, could you mute yourself, please? She's not in front of her computer, doesn't realize it. David, just what word do they use in place of radiant in your version? Well, were you able to the hear? The skin me? of his face was radiant. What is what is yours say? And it says, when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tables of the testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the Mount, that Moses knew not that the skin of his face sent forth beams while he talked with Beam. him. Right. Beams. Beams. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, 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 Larry and then Don. Okay, the image of beams or radiation coming out of your head, that is why Michelangelo, um, his famous statue of yeah. Moses with horns. So yes. The misinterpretation. Yes. yes. I don't have a way to mute grace. But she's in a discussion, and it, it, it Grace, are you there? <clears throat> Hello, Grace. <laughs> okay, well that's okay. Maybe it's it's quiet now. She's going to be so, embarrassed. <laughs> and and it, it's okay. She didn't realize. So uh, radiant, and and as you were saying, the. What was the phrase again? Um, In his skin was, was his face what was, was the radiant. phrase, David, that you what you, you read? Beam. It was beam down from Mount Sinai. Just the word, just the word. Testimony. Uh, the skin of his face sent forth beams. Well, okay. That's good. So send forth beams. And uh, Larry was explaining from Friedman. Okay, Larry, for those who may not have heard it, why don't you read? Michael had his hand up, and I know Gail had her hand up. And Rabbi Norman and, and Don, Don. Don did too, right, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I'm quoting now from Fox radiating or radiant. As is well known, Michelangelo created his famous horned statue of Moses um, on the basis of the Latin translation of the Bible, which rendered the Hebrew Karin as horn. Um, and so it was again another translation. So we have Radiant beams, horned and transformed. Right. But basically, the image that they used was coming out of the head. Right. And and uh, it, it it I I believe it's Rembrandt that uses the radiant face and has the a more of a glowing type of face, not horned. So I, I, so, but rabbis, do you want to discuss the root word? Sure. Please, Rabbi Norman, and then we'll sure. go to the, 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 root, the root word is the same as my daughter's name is Karen. Right. Which is on the one hand, 
uh, three different ways that we, when we see the word. A Karen can be a corner. It also it also can be a fund, like you might know, like the JNF is the Karen Kayemet is the you know fund uh, uh, planting the trees and re renovation and re uh, restoration in Israel. But here a Karen is a horn, right? And but what happens based on what we were talking about before is that the Hebrew is translated into the whether it's the Aramaic first or the Greek whatever and then jerome translates from the greek into the latin michelangelo didn't know hebrew he didn't know greek mm -hmm. he was only using the the latin book that was in front of him which said horned that uh, moses's head horned and so that's where he gets his his inspiration i would only add one other thing for those of us who live in the desert or especially if you've been in in the desert like the sinai desert or the negev desert and if like me if you don't have that much hair in the front anymore and you have don't aren't wearing your 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 hat uh, the uh, the sun the the sun rays off of the sunburn uh you know uh can indeed look radiant they can radiate you know light that way and uh that may be a very you know secular explanation of what of what was happening but it's also a possible explanation of why moses hit his face was so sunburned and been at the top of the mountain there in the desert okay now michael did you have very good rabbi thank you I, i'm going I to, to ask rabbi mary first and then I'm I going to speak ask all the other people. Because I wait object minute, wait, to Rabbi Norman. Hold up. I'm going to ask <laughs> okay, Rabbi I Mary go first ahead. to add to this, and then I'll come back to all the other raised hands. Okay. Yes, Rabbi Mary. Okay. Uh, Rabbi Norman took the word of his daughter, Karen, and gave you some explanations. But Kufresh Nun, these letters, the root of them means Karan. In the word right. should be Karan, not Karen. Karan means that his face, as your translation, was enlightening. Well, uh, I come and see my grandkids. My face is full of, of light. Karan. Mm -hmm. Now, they didn't have in the uh, the Torah that was translated, they didn't have vowels, so they hardly had words. So uh, in my in my explanation is Karan, his face. And I think that several of you said radiant. Now, when I travel uh, abroad, I go to many churches as probably all of you do and moshe is depicted with the horn and i always laugh at it because later on in the middle ages or even later we as jews were depicted with horn mm -hmm. and tail and the prototype put could be moshe in the mistake of saying Karen rather than Karan. Very good. Uh, I just want to interject that as recently this happened to me and my wife when in Washington, D.C. in 1967 where our neighbors asked us the same question where are your horns okay and we had to go into this discussion back then so it's it's uh, it's very common even to this day for some people they still believe that we have horns i beat okay. you by a year 1966 my college roommate in in the shower in the dormitory ah uh, yeah it's very common 
Very common. Okay, now there was a bunch of hands up before. Michael, I know your hand was up. Gail has her hand up. Marsha, did you have your hand up before? No. Oh. I th I th the, the, the thing is, and S Suzanne and back to Don. So let me go around. Just Michael, you first. Uh, when Moses went up to the mountain and he was in the presence of God, uh, it, it, uh, I, I would think that simply by being in the, prince, the presence of God, and, and I don't mean to say that's a simple uh, situation, but I don't know how long he was up there, but I think that God wanted, when he left the mountain, I think God wanted the people to know that Moses was in the presence of God. And so this, uh, this transformation of his of the glow and the beam uh, would would impact the the Israelites, knowing that he was in the presence of God. Something there, and so that's mm -hmm. the way I'm viewing this. Good point. Good point. Okay, uh, I'm going to go across uh, the top row, and um, I know Gail had her hand up. And Suzanne, I don't know who had their hands up first, and and David and and also Don. So why don't I just run it across on my screen, Gail? You you're on first. Okay, just very briefly. The the real importance of this whole thing is that his face was changed. You know, translation wow. aside, it doesn't right. matter. It was changed. It was noticeable. Now my true story. I've actually observed this. <clears throat> when my youngest daughter got married on her wedding day, her face actually glowed. And I mean, it was a true light. People commented on it. So I've actually seen this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I believe this. Something was going on with her that caused this light to come out of her face. It was, it was amazing. Anyway, the, the real thing is that the people noticed that there was a change. I don't care what it was, but it was noticeable. So, enough. Okay. Thank you. A drink, Thank a you. A drink going on there. Yeah. Suzanne? And then, oh, okay. I, I, I'll come back to you, Rabbi. I, I want to give some people a chance mm -hmm. that haven't said much today. So, first, first Suzanne, then David, and then I will go to Don and, and the rabbi. Okay, Suzanne, you're on first. Okay, uh, as opposed to who? <laughs> That's right, <laughs> it crossed my mind as I said it. That's very good. <laughs> Anyways, my, my version says face shown. And, uh, <clears throat> yes. and this also, the same phenomena also <clears throat> in the New Testament um when jesus was talking with moses and elijah <clears throat> i forget which mount they were on but <clears throat> i i take this uh, uh radiance or light or however we want to call it um as coming coming from from god that his his light his glory uh rub, rubs off on whoever is in his presence. And we know that he has <laughs> light because um, the sun and the moon and the stars, that all came af afterwards. I forget what day in creation it was, but it certainly wasn't day one. Um, so oh, how did I want to finish? Um, well, anyways, so th this was God's glory, and it, it's also in the New Testament as well, which I know you would guys would not have, but I'm telling you that it's there, and the same thing happened. Very good. Thank you. Yes, David, you're on. Yeah, I was just going to say um, two things. One is that I think the reason that uh, all of the... Um, Ray, radiance was coming out of Moses' face was he was angry because he couldn't get his Zoom account to work. 
<laughs> okay, but the other the other thing is more serious. A modern interpretation in the Ten Commandments, they picture Moses going up to the burning bush, and this is a lot earlier from what we're talking about today. But when he comes back, they show him with the radiance. And uh, I mean, it's, it's a little bit out of time, out of sequence, but they do have him when he comes back from the burning bush. He is a completely changed person and the radiance is there. Very good, thank you. Uh, I Now, Don, I, get, I, I think you're on. I don't know if I skipped anyone. Everyone, okay, go ahead, Don. You, you, you two, things, two things, my translation says shown as well, like Susan's. Uh, and I like simple words, I think that gets it. Um, and, uh, but secondly, um, it's qualified right after that, that the people were afraid of him. So it wasn't your ordinary cosmetic. Well, we'll get to that part. We'll get to that part. And then sure. the other thing, the, the, the root of um, skin, Latin root of skin is keratin. So mm -hmm. it's. Uh, yeah, keratin. Yeah, just mentioned. Okay. Yes, yes, uh, Suzanne. Yeah, I forgot to mention, I never heard this uh, uh, information about Moses and the horns um, ever. And uh, I, I find that very shocking. Yeah, well, but it's a good topic for discussion, you know, discussion. Well, purposes. true, but I mean, I'm, I'm glad I never heard of it. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, we, we use this phrase in the English language. Somebody who has a glowing personality. Uh, someone who is so, so happy, so happy that their face glowed. Someone uh, who was so knowledgeable. Uh, we use we you know it has many connotations that we do and 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 it's usually a positive attribute of that person, you know somebody that we want to become we want to get closer to. It 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 it, it because we want to to be a part of that glow, and we want to listen to them more more. So, so it, it, it's just something that, that we see. For another example, there are fabrics that glow, and we're attracted to those. We're attracted to silk, rayon, nylon, okay? Makeup, certain types of makeup, okay? And so it goes on and on. We, we cherish that glowing appearance, even when we go for Botox injections. <laughs> okay. So it, 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 there are lots of different ways that this, this the, 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 the concept of a glowing personality or lit, taking it literally that the face glows uh, it, it's a very important concept, but here, the glowing is so so much. The glow from this is so much, and the face has been tr transformed into uh, it, the red, as the rabbi was saying, it's sunburn. But everything about Moses was glowing and radiant, and just like you find other biblical figures being radiant it just just as you find other biblical uh, figures being radiant moses is now in that category of being someone extremely important yes michael uh yeah what as you were speaking it's reminded me uh in, in the in the theatrics <coughs> and in the arts uh, there, there's mm -hmm. special lighting to make somebody glow. 
Yes. You know, that's how, it, but it, 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 that's the importance that I would bring that out because I'm, since I'm familiar with that. And, it's the angle of the of the light that's used. It's from, yeah. The, also, yeah, the yeah, angle and the uh, and color and the, uh, the the tint, the angle mm -hmm. and also the tint, the color and the tint of lighting. Very good. Okay, so uh, you're okay, Grace. Thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, I, yeah, I, I just think it's it's a very interesting uh passage here and it, unfortunately it it was grabbed on by people who wanted to uh find a negative characteristic for us and it by the way it, it appears in many cartoons as well uh th up up through uh the 1900s yes rabbi norman yeah i don't want to well first first i want to thank suzanne that which is i put up my hand earlier on it was because I, I knew apologize. that there was a, a New Testament, uh, you know, particular in, incident where the radiant face and whatever came up, and, uh, and and I was hoping that she could identify where where it was. Um, I, I'm th there's another piece of this, and uh, Rabbi Miri sent me a, a a text about you know using the the word as a verb, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and it, I really started to do an, a, a quick analysis. Um, the Hebrew doesn't make sense in the way that we're translating it, incidentally. Oh. Um, because Quran or the Quran is 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 a verb rather than rather than an adjective. Okay, um, and you could make a case and say that. He probably meaning God caused Moses's skin to shine, to be radiant, you know, whatever. Um, which 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 adds a, a different take on it. That that yes. uh, okay. That that God specifically set this sign upon Moses which also can play into some of the, whether it's intentional or unintentional, fixation of early Christianity of the Jews, like the devil having horns. So that, you know, that God placed this, this particular sign on Moses or this particular change. Uh, yeah. Back to the first word that we heard, I think, from Gail of transformed or something like that right um, that's right you know, that god transformed moses's skin uh to to look differently so uh, th it's in a torah you turn it around you turn it you turn it you turn it and you find a different way every time you've looked at this at this particular verse god knows how many times over 60 70 years and they always find a new way of looking through it that's true very good point very good uh, and if if god did that it's uh, a miracle he comes transformed that's a very important people uh, uh effect for the people that are looking at look what happened he was so long and he's transformed so maybe uh, it, uh, excellent point grace i want you to uh, to mention what you're what you were uh, saying in, in your, your chat message. You Shabbat there? shalom, everyone. Oh, yes. Hi. Good. Yeah. I was, was listening to all the features that everyone is sharing. What a great discussion that, you know, when you talk about theater and then they don the light and they spotlight the individual person of the moment. I think that perhaps I would like to look at it maybe this way. God was spotlighting Moses for the people to see. But just a collective I think it's thought. a very good way of putting it. it we, I think what you, you just said summarized what we spent a half hour discussing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a lot of help from everybody's input. So you know, I'm here listening. <laughs> oh that was Thank good you. 
Oh, uh, by the way, my on, on my screen, everyone has been juggled around in their position. So I may miss hands or things like that what, from time to time because of that. Anyway, um, any other discussion about the uh, the spotlighting or as Grace put it? Well, so Moses' face is radiant or whatever, and uh, uh, it, it may be emanating rays of light, uh, and the people were, uh, were afraid. They feared that. But if we would start now with verse 32. David, if you would read 32 yeah, okay. and 33. Okay, and afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment. The word commandment appears there. All that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had done speaking with him, he put a veil on his face. Any comments about this? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I missed what David said about commandments. I was just pointing out that the word commandment that we've been discussing earlier finally appears in my translation in this verse. Uh, I think that you're, you've been misled. Okay. 34, verse Mo 34. Moses is, Moses is the one who commands them. It's not God's commandments. In, 30, in 32? 32. Yeah. yeah. This um, is Moses speaking to the yeah, people. Right. Okay. Moses, uh, my translation says instructed, but it's the verb to command there. He, command, he commands them all that God said to him. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Okay. You. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, Helene, please. This is all uh, difficult for me, of course, and I'm listening carefully. But am I wrong? When I hear the word Greek, the Greek rendition, is that the final rendition? What, whose, whose rendition is accepted in today's society? Which, which of them? Ten Commandments? The, the, the Orthodox, you know what they call it? The Hasidic. The Hasidic Jews have the Ten Commandments. That's the ones that they say are the original God-given commandments. Right. And is that true or not true? Not today. Today, it's who you are, where you come from, what your language is, what your emotions say, and what your heart says. Okay. And I think that's the best thing we can do is go into those and say, God bless us all. Every one of us that thinks about God and thinks about commandments should be blessed. And that's my last thought. It's a good way of putting it. Grab by uh, Norman wanted yeah, to I, say I, I would agree I would agree completely wholeheartedly and thank you Helene and uh, all the all the last things that you said are all completely true the answer to your first question is we meaning the Jewish people only believe in and accept the Hebrew version of the Torah okay there are a couple words here and there that are maybe in other in other languages or like marty say maybe come from the proto-semitic or the you know or, or or this and that but um because the literature is so important and others would say because it's so sacred it's been translated into other languages what what our whole discussion about the the radiance and the shining and the and the transforming in the horns is because the people thousands of years ago didn't know the original. They didn't know the Hebrew. They didn't look at the original text. They were basing everything off of 
what they saw, which was already a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation. Oh. And every time you do that, it makes a little subtle, a subtle change in what the words might have meant, as you said, because of the different, the different way that a different generation uses, uses the word or understands or doesn't understand. So they make a minor, a minor change. But as far as the Jewish community is concerned, orthodox, traditional, liberal, progressive, reformed, conservative, whatever you want to say, our Torah, the text is the same that it has been for a couple thousand years. Thank you. Thank you. Very well, very well stated, yeah. Rabbi. So any further discussion about the veil? Yes, Larry. Larry? Go okay, ahead. first we have a radiant face and the discussed all of the meanings of that. Now we are putting a veil on the face. Now, um, Friedman says, um, interestingly, this connects with the covering and curtain in the tabernacle, the site of holiness. He proposed this has to be partitioned off and enveloped in layers, and yet it remains accessible to the people. So uh, maybe after he's blowing, people seem to be afraid and now mask uh, more accessible. Other interpretations? Okay, I think that's a good, uh, that's a very interesting interpretation. I did not, uh, personally, I did not see the compa comparison right away like that. Yeah, yes, uh, uh, Rabbi Norman. So, so picking up on this, some of you know what the um, the literature known as responsa, okay, of uh, responsa literature. Hmm. So one of the earliest responsa literature, which is basically question and answer, um, one of the earliest ones that we have concerns head covering, okay. And you may not know because the tradition has kind of modified it that originally Jews did took off their hats when they prayed. Okay. That in that was the original. It has changed, and we're not really sure why or 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 when. But in this one response that says. It, it's still okay if you real if you've if you've prayed your prayers to God and you realize that you forgot to took, take your head covering off, are your prayers still valid? That that was the question. The answer is yes, they're still valid. It's preferable if you take your hats off. It's a sign of respect, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this particular incident is 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 quoted. That what when Moses went in to speak with God, he took the covering off of his head. Therefore, we should be doing the same. Okay, mm -hmm. I just wanted to go for my point. That's the one of the earliest, uh, you know, experiences or justifications that they that they have in there. Somewhere along the line, tradition changed, and and so now the Jewish tradition is that when you're worshiping God or studying about God that you, you're supposed to put your head on, even though every other culture says no, when to show respect, you doff your hat. But just wanted to share that one. Very interesting. We, we need the hat to cover the horns. Ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Amy now, uh, had her hand up, and I know Dave wanted to say something. Sorry, yes, Amy, sorry. it's okay. Yes, Amy, and we'll, we'll get back to you, Mary. Go ahead, Amy. This is a question for one of our rabbis. Um, you know, a bride is unveiled. What is the significance, the Jewish, the Hebrew significance of a, a veil, whether it's a bride or um, Moses? You mean the, the veil? She, she's veiled, veiled for for the marriage ceremony. Connection. She's veiled at the marriage ceremony. Right. Okay. Mary, you, you, would you like to? 
Well, um, I'm thinking of Rachel, of Rachel. Um, if you remember, Rachel comes on top of uh, riding either a camel or a donkey, I don't remember. But she covers her face before coming <coughs> to Jacob, right? To Jacob, uh, it, no, it's Isaac. Who's no, uh, it's Isaac? Isaac. Rachel. <laughs> uh, Rachel and I, Rachel sees, and Jacob, Rebecca and Isaac. Yeah, oh, right. So when she sees Jacob, because they are going to be married, she never saw him, and she covers her face. Uh, so maybe it comes from there uh, that that that's how they meet, and probably in the tent of used to be of Sarah. They remove the veil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, probably other vestments as well. Uh, but uh, what I was looking is for the word that Rachel was covering her face. If here it says veil, uh, I don't know. I, I didn't have enough time to 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 look at it. Uh, I'm talking about the word. I, I love words, so I was talking about the word. Uh, but I think it comes from there, that she comes covered to see her beloved, not beloved, she didn't make it before, and only then she uncovers. Am I right, Rabbi? Yeah, there, and there's, there's two steps to it. One is that the groom places the veil of, over her, responding with the same words that Rachel's family used to bless her as in at, at that time. But the but the other is that the groom gets the chance to make sure that the fa that the, the, got the right hasn't one. substituted yeah. a different <laughs> sister. Okay, so it's, yeah, you know, I it's, forgot it's, about it's, that one. Right, yeah. you get to identify that it's the right. <laughs> this this yeah. is indeed, and today we do it both ways. We 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 ask the groom, you know, is this the is this the woman that you intend to marry? We ask the bride, is this the man that you intend to marry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or we should say, is this the spouse that you intend to marry? So, okay, right. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Go Do you ahead, remember? Michael. Because uh, Jacob, when he comes, uh, Lavan gives him Leah instead of Rachel. Right. So now we want to make sure that it's mm -hmm. the right one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, Michael. Uh, I want to uh, talk to the rabbi. I asked him the question as far as the head covering. Uh, is it uh, so app apparently it's it's optional uh to wear the head covering now at at this moment at discussing the torah i don't think you're wearing a head covering i can't see the back yet but Me? I don't think no i'm not you're not. I'm not but the you but i notice you do wear a head covering when for example you do a saturday morning service so or, how do or you a friday night service Right. Well, mm -hmm. Friday, yeah, for Saturday, for, cause I, I can't attend Friday night anymore. So Saturday morning, I, I could do that because of my driving at night. And so how do you distinguish, how do you personally distinguish the difference where you would not, uh, don't, there, you know, the cover, because in my opinion, the Torah study is, is just as important talking about God and the Torah as a Saturday morning service. So... Mm -hmm. How do you make that distinction? How do you how, how do you do that? Me, me me personally. Yeah. Me personally, I base it on the principle of what's called minhag hamakom. Okay, that it's the minhag, it's the custom of the place for worship and for and for Torah study, etc., in the synagogue to to wear head covering. And so, and I res and I respect that when I'm in my own home. I don't necessarily feel the same way. It doesn't. It doesn't have any impact for me. No impact what's, what, whatsoever. Therefore, I choose. I choose not to in my home. But if I'm coming into a synagogue, then I will absolutely, without hesitation, put it on. 
That's my, that's, mm -hmm. that's how I make my decision. I do the okay. same thing. Amy, you've been very patient with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are different congregations um, besides um, the Jewish congregation that will wear a head covering. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll see it more with the women than the men. And it's, they're called prayer caps. So when you're, they wear them all day long as a reminder that everything they do should be for the glory of God and just to keep them mindful. Okay. Usually the, the mindful and, and humble. Hum, the word humble is usually added on there too. Yes. Interesting. Thank you, Amy. That was that was an interesting point that you made. Yes, Rabbi Mary. Uh, this is again about the word. Uh, the word is masve. Is not. Um, it can buy for mechase uh, to, to cover, but also today in Hebrew, the military when they use the different colors on their uniform is for asva'a. So they mix with yeah. the plants and the desert and so forth. Right. And right. I never saw the word that came from there. So I appreciate coming to that point. Like camouflage. So, <laughs> camouflage. Right. Camouflage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Any other discussion here? Well, let's uh, try to finish up with verses 34 and 35. Okay, so uh, go ahead, David. Yes, please. Okay, sure. Um, 34. But when Moses went in before the Lord, that he might speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spoke unto the children of Israel, that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face sent forth beams. And Moses put the veil back upon his face until he went in to speak with him. Okay. Any discussion, comments, ideas? Yes, Rabbi Mary. If you remember at one point, uh, it said, God, the people want to see God. And God said, those that saw my face, Moshe also, those that saw my face are going to die. And here he covers his face, maybe not to see God. Um, never thought about it before, but uh, maybe that's the case. You cannot see God and lead. Okay. It's a good point. Uh, Grace, your hand is up. I I don't know if you wanted to join in it now or before. It just dawned on me. You've had your hand up for a while. Um, I was just going to mention that I wear a head covering to keep me warm. <laughs> 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 If my head and my ears are covered, I stay warmer. So I often will wear something on my head. Okay. All right. It's yeah. interesting. That, when the women, yeah, go ahead. When, the, when Jewish women cover their head, there is not just the issue of respect, but what's going on also is that the hair of women is a sexual attraction. So that uh, the Orthodox women cover the, the hair and maybe they shave, some do, and some create new hair and put it on top. But so it, it, I, I just find it, the, the subject is, is also very interesting because in Islam, we, women have to wear a veil in the, the strict I'm going to call it the orthodoxy of the uh, of the um, 
of the uh, Islamics. Mostly, it, yeah. It, and they wear a veil, and they have a diff, they have other reasons for it. Okay, because it, you mentioned, uh, you know, the the the, um, the veil over the, the head uh, or a headpiece uh, that it may be distracting to to men to see the woman as she really is, and that that's part of it. I know even it, that's why a curtain is between men and women, and so it. They take this as a, another step forward so that you focus your attention on things. But here, in this, what we're reading here, when Moses is speaking to God, or if he's past, if he's speaking God's words to the people, he will remove his mask. So the radiance is, is always present. Uh, nothing more is mentioned about the veil, to my uh, to my knowledge, uh, in the rest of Torah. So I have to ask the question: Does Moses do this all the time, forever, or just when this experience has taken place? It, it, I don't see any other uh, any other explanations. I, I know Larry signed off. Uh, maybe somebody has it. Uh, Friedman edition. It does. It's not meant discussed in plow. Uh, other than what we've already mentioned, and that there we've covered uh, what uh, what uh, Morgan Stern and. Uh, and Cohen say in plow. So I, I guess, Amy. Do we know how long uh, his face radiates? It, it, it may say. have just been for a period of time and then it lost its radiance. We don't know. It lost. So he may have needed to fail after a period of time. So that was the question, and uh, Rabbi Norman is coming back, and I'll ask, ask the question again. Uh, Amy, why don't you say it, uh, the, the, the veil? Go ahead. Ask, ask the rabbi your question. Well, when Moses was radiating or reflecting the glory of God, he covered and he addressed the people who were frightened by this uh, radiation, um, we wondered how long, if Moses had to keep putting the veil on and taking the veil off, and until, I until propose the, until the sunburn went we, away. It, <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't know how long he radiated, so maybe it wasn't until the end of life, but it maybe it was just for a period of time. I, I I don't remember there being a specific moment or verse where it says, and as of such and such a point, Moses no longer no longer did that. Um, I, I so I don't think that they identified it. Uh, I, I don't have a better uh, other than like I said the 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 flippant answer of when the when the when the sunburn healed. Uh, but, uh, you know, you know, but, uh, I, I don't really know. Uh, I can't identify anything more than that, that I remember. Maybe in our reading, we will encounter something, but I don't remember it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, that, that was my take on it too. I couldn't find anything before grace and then David. So this reminds me of Tevia when he's talking in the beginning most of us here have probably seen Fiddler on the Roof. And he, he talks about why they wear the, the, the prayer shawls and the shawls and, so, and the head covering. We cover our heads. Didn't he say we cover our heads out of respect to Reverence. God? Reverence. Reverence. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. but, they were, but they, in, in the shtetl, 
they wore they wore the head covering 24 24 7 well maybe not 24, yeah. maybe not while they're sleeping but uh and certainly not you know not not when they're in the well they didn't have too many showers those days but uh, they were they well, were it was cold it was cold where they were too so you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know the, but again the skull cap the skull cap didn't bring you a lot of warmth. You may have worn a a big you know strimal, but uh, not not a little skull cap. But okay, I was just curious. It just made, reminded mm -hmm. me of that scene that he did. Okay, thank you, David. Um, I. Um, one of the things that we were talking about earlier is that the radiance. Excuse me, David, could you move closer to your microphone? I'm sorry, Thank you. is this better? Yes. Yeah, one of the things that I was, we were talking about earlier was that the radiance may be related to a sunburn. The last time that I had that situation was when I was in Flagstaff at the memorial service for Carolyn Shoemaker last May. The sun was shining very bright. I had no head covering and uh, the top of my head got a pretty bad sunburn and it lasted for about three, four hours before it finally started to dissipate. So if that is an explanation, as was mentioned earlier, then I would say that the uh, radiance would disappear after a few hours, but okay. not a few minutes. Okay, Amy had her hand up again, and then uh, and then Gail, and then Michael. This isn't terribly important, but uh, Rabbi Norman mentioned not showering, getting many showers in the desert. How did the Hebrews bathe for 40 years in the desert. Oasis, oasis. Is that the plural of an oasis? Is oasis? Yes. Yeah. That's one, but I doubt if they would necessarily do it in the drinking water. <clears throat> they quite frequently, Bedouins bathe in sand. They rub it on yeah, their right. skin, okay, and uh, and so nomadic people going and Native Americans did the same thing, and Aborigines in Australia did the same thing. So and elephants do. They use mud, okay, and then when it comes off, it, it's it's like going to the uh, a salon and getting a mud pack, okay. The <laughs> elephants do the same thing. And other other critters do the same thing too. So there are ways of doing it without a shower head and water spilling over you. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, any uh, there was another hand up before. Oh, Gail, Gail that's right. Gail and, and then Michael. Michael, that's right. I just I have a question about the prayer shawl for the rabbis. Um, I know in the Orthodox, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm synagogue they take the shawl and they cover their heads with it yeah right i mean you're it's like a tent right so mm -hmm. when did is that tied in with what we're talking about here about going in and being veiled or cover or behind you know something is, is that the significance of the prayer shawl i mean i know with the you know the threads and the colors and things but uh, i i don't <laughs> right. I I don't really know, uh, uh, you know, what uh, certain communities, certain congregations, um, certain the the those who are Kohanim, those who are Levim, you know, will wear it differently. Some will keep their heads, the, the, their entire head covered through the entire worship service. Others will just when they put it on and then they'll put it back on their shoulders and in one or two prayers they'll bring it back over again there um th those are all local local customs um that as opposed to this is the particular what we call a dean this is a particular judgment on how you're 
on how you're supposed to. Uh, oh, it's more of a minhag from, from temple to temple then. Temple to temple or or community yes. to community. Um, the size of the the size of the uh, uh, the the size of the talit. Right. Um, uh, you know, all all those kinds of things really really have a different and in many cases it's oh well and i overheard somebody talking in a similar thing yesterday uh, it, it, in many cases it's oh that's the way my father or my grandfather or that's the way my grand my my rabbi did it i you know so i just assume that that's the correct way to do it and no one really knows what the what the origin was originally yeah, I, you, know, the, I, you know the story of why you know why you know why a meatloaf uh you know has has to be squared off because it otherwise it was too be too large to fit into the oven or you know or why <laughs> when people came in through a certain door they always bowed well that was because there was a low a, a you know a low chandelier you know it had nothing to do with uh, with anything that else that was going on in the room it's just that everybody assumed that there was a, some a a different kind of importance to it. Well, the, the prayer shawl to me, if, if I was a kind of a woman, not a man, but the significance to me would be covering your head. It gives you some privacy. You're turning off any distractions mm -hmm. while you're praying. So perfect. That, that yeah. would be perfect. A, and, yeah. in, and incidentally, Gail, if, I, yeah. Gail yeah. if I may say so, there's nothing in Jewish law that says you can't wear a talis, a prayer shawl. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, uh, a, a little bit more information oh. about that. Then I want to get to something else, please. But uh, I've had the uh, uh, the benefit of attending uh, Orthodox when I was growing up. And then uh, when I got to California for thirty eight years, I attended the uh, Conservative, and now the Reform. But to, add, to, to re address some of your issue, it's also, I see it as also personalized from rabbi to rabbi. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some uh, the, uh, the Rabbi Elias, the one, uh, and, and who is a conservative in, 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 in the Hollywood area, uh, when, he, uh, when he came to the, uh, uh, the uh, Amishu Bear, the, the prayer for healing for, for people, he would cover his head because he wanted total privacy like you said he was trying to create a very very uh, uh, a, 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 a just a straightforward privacy uh, between him and god that, that nothing should break that those prayers for the for healing and recovery so i see it sometimes as a a personal between mm -hmm. between rabbis uh, it, could, it could also it could also be almost like a a symbol of the tent of meeting. Mm, could be sure, sure. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, everything you said is very plausible, and, and uh, you don't you can't uh, always get into the mind of the rabbi at a moment what he's thinking and how he perceives and and what he uh, had learned from his father who was a rabbi. So you don't you know. And Rabbi Roman had made a good point concerning that. Uh, but co concerning now that the head covering, uh, I think I kind of forgot what I was going to say. Uh, uh, but also for what I mentioned, I had the benefit of now, uh, uh, I, and I've been involved with the reformed. And I see, a, I personally see a, 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 a real break between the reformed, the conservative, and the uh, orthodox. Uh, because what I personally have learned all, all those years, I'm 78 years old, uh, and, and so uh, what I have learned that the... the, the, the Uh, the, okay, the important uh, Michael, Michael, what I'm going to do is I, I want before we we finish with this, because this is gradually moving to in, into other areas as far as the the Kippa and and uh, and like that. Uh, I know there's 
some hands. Uh, Amy had her hand up for a long time now, and same with Marsha. So let me call on Amy and Marsha, okay, so they have a, a chance to speak before we finish. And then we'll come back to you, okay? Sure. And please, whoever, uh, Marsha, could you mute your, your uh, microphone, please? Thank you. Uh, Amy. Amy, you're on. The Christians have... Um, a way of handling that for similar, but for different reasons. And they have something that's called a prayer closet. And it's the idea that you remove yourself from others so that you're not tempted to sing louder than everyone else and uh, uh, promote yourself as being more holy or more religious, but also to cover any distractions where you can only concentrate on your communication with God, your conversation with God, and not be distracted by a pretty lady's hat or <laughs> a crying baby or whatever. But it's also to prevent you from being too proud of yourself mm -hmm. for praying or displaying your ritual religiosity religiosity whatever that word is amy is, is, that a, is that an image or is that a particular place um for some um areas like in south korea um they often will have a structure that they go into where they can't be seen and it can be um well, like another room in your house, for instance, or another room in the the um, church uh, where you can go and nobody can see you. But it's also figuratively. Okay. All right. Very good. To Thank you. Divorce yourself from, from surroundings and sure. to keep you humble, keep mm -hmm. you focused. Very good. That's a, that's important. Marjorie, uh, please. Okay. I was told, and I don't know who, when you put on your prayer shawl, and I do wear one, uh, when you say the prayer for putting it on, you cover yourself. Is there anything that says that, or is that just what people do? That's, if you, if, that's what some people do. Some people, it, some people say the prayer, put it on. Some people put it on, say the prayer. Some people, I, I usually kiss both sides of the atara before I, before I put it on and then say the prayer. Um, people develop their own little, their own little customs. There's the, um, usually, usually a rule of thumb in Judaism with a few exceptions is that you per, say say the prayer before performing the deed okay that's that's usually the way that you do something so does that mean that you say the prayer and put it on and then put it down on your shoulders my thought was you cover yourself to say the prayer no it you doesn't matter it to say the prayer a lot of people will hold it up like this, and that's then that's because many times the talit will have the prayer written there, so they're mm -hmm. they're kind of reading it because you're not supposed to memorize your prayers, so you're supposed oh. to you're supposed to read it and then put it on. But uh, but again, there's the most important thing is to choose to wear it okay. <laughs> rather than in which order you do you do the things. That's my understanding. Thank you. Okay. Well, Michael, we're going back to you so that you can finish what you were saying. I wanted to be sure because I didn't know how I wanted everybody to have a chance to speak on the subject because we're running up against the, the clock right now. So let's go back to you and, and what you were talking about. 
Yeah, uh, I was uh, I was taught because I attended um, the Orthodox and and mm-hmm. mostly the conservative that it the uh, the the head covering and the addressing of God is very 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 important very critical and it's not the way you are it doesn't matter in in what I was taught you can be in the middle of the forest and you need to make some very strong prayers and you need to read the Torah, you've got to cover your head. This is what I was taught. And I find the the, the reform, it's has been very enlightening and very interesting to make these comparisons. Because like I said, I've attended now all three uh, 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 parts of Judaism. And that's really, really what I wanted to get out. Good point. It's an interesting observation and, and discussion that you you stimulated a lot of us with. Uh, so, so I'll raise a question about this. Suppose you're in the middle of a forest, or yeah. you're in the middle of a forest, yes, or in a desert, or on the ocean, and you suddenly are moved prayer you, you you say it's so beautiful and and this thought comes to you but you don't have a head covering is there any difference in saying what's in your heart is it going to be received better with or without a kippah no, it's what's in your heart. And if you don't have any, even if you have it in your pocket, let's say you have something in your pocket and it just came to you just like that. I think mm-hmm. you're in good shape. Okay. I think, I, I think <laughs> okay. you know, you're just, because it wasn't intended. It was like a, 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 a spur of the moment. Sure, it just came on you. That's right. And, and this happened to me many times when, when I was at the marina on my boat. I mean, things would just came to me that was so beautiful, you know, and, and I would say, thank God for whatever reason. And I, and I don't have any reservations about that, that I didn't have a yarmulke in my pocket. It just okay. came to me. But, okay. but on the other way, but this, what, what I was saying, what I was trying to get out was premeditated. I knew I'm going to go somewhere, so, you know. And I knew I'm going to get I'm going to get out the, the the book you know to read, so I have it all ready to go, because it's okay. you know it's premeditated. What you're saying is not premeditated. Okay, thank you. That's an interesting commentary, Rabbi uh, Marty. And I would I would just say that in light of the the scenario that you're presenting, is why some of the rabbis would say that's why you should keep your head covered all the time because you right. never know when that inspirational <laughs> moment will be there very good very well stated very well stated uh, thank you thank you rabbi mary well i'm connected to the renewal branch that uh michael you haven't been there yet but but the joy of the prayer can come with your body dancing and singing. And the Baal Shem Tov went to the, to the forest and in the forest, uh, he, he, he uh, prayed to God, to the wonders and so forth. So the issue of uh, how do you need to wear, what do you need to wear, where do you need to be, because most of the people say you pray in the synagogue, that's it. So um, so your question, Marty, I absolutely uh, agree. It's kavana, it's, uh, it's, it's it, 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 the saying is for, for praying you need kavana and uh, Rabbi, what's keva. the word? Keva. And keva. I mean, you do something every morning, three times a day, so forth, but it needs to have that part of the heart. Otherwise, it doesn't go right. I'm sorry. 
Okay. But no, it, it, it's interesting to hear all these different commentary. Thank you, everyone, for answering my question. I appreciate that. Well, we're coming up uh, to the close of our session, and I'm going to ask, as usual, are there any announcements? Oh, there's a lot happening this week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bagel breakfast tomorrow. Right. Anything else? Bagel breakfast tomorrow. Um, forum, forum on Monday. Four o'clock on Monday. Has, right. has classes on Thursday. We're correct. Men's, I'm I'm aware of those two. Yes. Men's, 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 men's club breakfast. Club breakfast on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And then we have a service next Saturday. Right. No. To, not. We don't have Torah study. We have no Torah study. No, services okay. next Saturday, and I will be wearing my keep off. So okay. <laughs> and, okay. And the question is: Is it black tipa or is it srugapi? Oh, I'll have a different. I'll have a different, different, different kind of keep keep off for Purim. But uh, yeah. okay. There, and if people go. can make their get their reservations in for the Passover seder and not wait till the last minute, it would be. Definitely mm -hmm. appreciated. Sounds Th good. Thank you, Marsha and Gail. Okay. Yeah, yes, Amy. And are we going to invite um, pastors of different congregations to join us for the Seder? It's that been discussed, never, but I don't know if it's that been was decided. Never decided. I don't know if it's an official decision, and I'm not sure that this is the right. The, the right forum to be yeah to yeah. be talking about it um i mean anyone is well anyone is welcome to come i mean that's yeah. that's not only a statement of Beth Shalom temple center that's a that's a statement in the haggadah right so, you know anyone who wishes to celebrate the passover with us is welcome to come if we start issuing special invitations then the question is, uh, are, do they pay the member price? Do right. they pay the non-member price? Are we giving them a special discount? Are we inviting them complimentary? Uh, and we get into all those. So anyone, anyone can invite anyone else. But if we're doing it officially as the temple center, it's a different question. Right. And, and if you need transportation, um, you know, let me know and... We see if we can arrange some carpools. Okay. Okay. Gail. Gail has her hand up, but Gail, you're muted. Mark, I will get to you, Mark. Gail, you're still muted. No. Oh, no, okay. I'm not Go ahead, Marsha. Go ahead, Marsha. Talking about Passover, if anyone has uh, a relic that make, means Passover to them, or some object that they have, we would love to make a Passover uh, display in the gallery. So just get to the, if it's your grandmother's chapa, which I have, and whatever it is, it would be nice to share it with the community for Passover. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So just so I get it right, um, the next Torah study will be in two weeks then. Correct. Two weeks, that is correct. Okay, well, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Have a Shabbat very Shabbat. healthy Thanks, and everyone. good week. And uh, see you at the holidays. Take care. Have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.